Are you fascinated by bot periodicity? Do you believe that it has metaphysical meaning? Are you a maniac about Clifford algebras? Well, this is for you and also for my friends, uh, John Harland at uh, Palomar College in California and uh, Thomas Gaidasek, who's with me. He's at uh, uh, Vilnius University. And I am Andrus Kolikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. So I've given uh, John and Thomas uh, both a preview of this talk. Uh, I've been working on this for several years, and this is uh, the latest installment of what I am understanding about bot periodicity, how it could model the divisions of everything, uh, which are building blocks of wondrous wisdom. And today is great for people who love Clifford algebras, uh, because I'm going to uh, show uh, what connects two different um, bot periodicities of Clifford algebras. So here on the left, I have this circle. And um, the real uh, Clifford algebras form an eight cycle, if you go around this circle here. But there's another version of that eight cycle, which is here in red. So starting with zero. And so the negative signs here, like negative one means that there's a single generator that squares to negative one. Negative two means there's two generators that square to negative two, three generators that square to negative three. And going in the other way, there's one generator that squares to plus one, two that square to uh, plus one, and three that square to plus one. So going this way, they're all squaring to minus one. And then at Sorry, four, you said, you said square to negative three. I think you meant three generators. I, exactly. Three. I got that wrong. Okay. So you're a good listener. Okay. So now uh, this will be either uh, four generators squaring each to plus one or four squaring to minus one. So this is one way to think about bot periodicity in terms of Clifford algebras. And this is another way of thinking about bot periodicity in terms of Clifford algebras. The black numbers, I mean, ADCs are, yeah, black. They're uh, actually most important for me because I'm trying to say that each one of these is a perspective that's dividing up everything. So like this would be the division of everything into two perspectives, three perspectives, four perspectives, five and six and seven perspectives. And then with zero, it means if you have eight perspectives, it collapses. It's like having no perspectives and it keeps going. Um, and we made headway uh, on this and you visited me, John, in uh, Lithuania. And so we looked at a paper by Stone, uh, Chu and Roy talking about this uh, in terms of mutually anti-commuting linear complex structures, J1, J2, J3, and they're imposing commutativity on, um, let's say, an orthogonal group, which could be, let's say, 16 by 16. And then it, if you look at the things uh, that commute with one or two or three or more anti-commuting structures like this, then you get uh, an embedding of Lie groups, which go smaller, 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 smaller. Uh, unitary, symplectic, and then it continues. So we got some intuition on that, but I could only go so far. I wanted more intuition, and I thought, well, there's another way of looking at bot periodicity, which has to do with these operators. Um, time reversal, T, which can square to plus or minus one. Charge conjugation, C, which can square to plus or minus one. And parity, parity which would be C times T which can square to plus or minus one. And so, but these two uh, right here are building blocks and you can see I've written the plus one or let's say the minus one in green and in gray. You would go through different combinations. <laughs> so I'll be talking about that. And then the Clifford algebra in red is what I'll be trying to really focus on today. And so uh, I'm just starting to get some feeling, what is that about? But it's about imposing structure that could be real or complex or quaternionic. And so um, we'll talk about that. So I'm going to uh, do my best to show how the Clifford algebra in this black numbers 
is related to the Clifford algebra in the red numbers. The, 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 the eight cycles are related. So in this, uh, you've seen before, and, and uh, Thomas has seen before, I've made a video about this. Uh, these are um, the metaphysical information that I'm trying to model. These are divisions of everything into one or two or three or four or five or six or seven or eight perspectives uh, with it collapsing when it has eight perspectives. So looking out for things like that. So like a three cycle for learning of taking a stand, following it through and reflecting. And we'll see three cycles here in yellow. It's hard to see, but this is like two switches. That's the foursome. The twosome is like one switch. So these are four levels of knowledge. This is like, let's say, the relationship between like opposites coexisting as with uh, free will and, and them all being the same as with fate. So this is what I'm trying to model. This is what got me interested in bot periodicity. And so there's um, three ways of looking at this um, that we'll be talking about. And they all build up to 10. So uh, you're familiar with 8 plus 2 equals 10. That's this eight cycle of the real Clifford uh, algebras. But there's also two complex Clifford algebras uh, that form a much more simpler cycle. That's eight plus two. But you can think of it also as three times three plus one equals 10. So we'll be looking at this, uh, um, these um, operators. So let's say this is time reversal in, let's see, this is charge conjugation in green. So that can square to plus one or minus one or be blank. That's three possibilities. And then the gray could be plus one or minus one uh, if they square or blank. That's three possibilities. So three times three is nine. And we'll, we'll see how nine plus one is 10. And then there's also three plus seven is 10 because there's three division algebras. That's called the Dyson's uh, threefold way. The real the quaternion, and over here, the complexes. But there's seven superdivision algebras uh, that are uh, not trivial. They're not just even, but they actually they, they, they have pairs of division algebras. Uh, so there's seven that are uh, in addition to those three. So let's start with the, um, uh, the operators that uh, three times three plus one equals 10. And so when we have... Um, when we have um, these operators, um, basically, um, there's a sense in which they, um, yeah, th those that square two plus or minus one, those are lifts. So they're related to these operators, C bar, T bar, C bar, T bar. Uh, these are like switches, basically. So you can, we'll be, you can think of this as Z2 cross Z2. So where Z2 is the, the group of uh, size two, order two, which has a identity and then it has a non-identity. Let's say that you could call that C bar. So here's an example, like this is a Z2 where one and C bar and, or like one and T bar, that's also a uh, Z2. Uh, but if you have Z2 cross Z2, you can also have their product Z bar, C bar, T bar. So that's two switches would have four elements. So how many subgroups are possible? That'll be relevant for us. So if you have these uh, two switches and you have four elements, well, there's the whole group. There's the trivial subgroup, which means that uh, there's basically no switches. But if you have a single switch, that's Z2, there's three ways to do that. You could have, let's say the left switch, C bar, or you could have the right switch, T bar, or you could have them in combination where you switch both or you switch them both off. So those are the five subgroups of Z2 cross C2. Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay. So you both know? So uh, here, like what's the pattern we get? Well, like I was saying, if you have three options for um, T and T bar, uh, I'm sorry, for T squared, it's either plus or minus one, or there isn't any T. Well, then, and similarly for C, well, then you should get three times three. So there's eight of them right here. Now, if they both exist, well, there's four ways that they could uh, 
you know, be assigned, you know, either plus or minus one. If one of them does not exist, then there's another four ways, okay? Because each one could be plus or minus, let's say. Then the one that's missing is when they, neither of them exist. So we put that off to the side. That'll be basically for the complex case. And there's a 10th possibility where neither exist, but like we saw with the subgroups, if you, their combination, their product exists. Okay, so it exists in common. So that would be like saying parity exists. So time reversal may not exist and charge quantum case may not exist, but parity is their product. So maybe parity exists and you can have parity or not, let's say. So Andres, it's, I'm not sure what I'm looking at here. Um, this is just outer, like a, the outer this is circle, a combinatorial picture. Mm -hmm. The outer circle is has to do with T, the inner one has to do with C. Exactly. Okay. There's a possibility that T can square to positive one. Those are the possibilities on top or negative mm -hmm. one. Right. And then there's a possibility that C can square to positive one or negative one. This just the way that these two can fit together. These are the possibilities. I see. So either the ones where there's pairs of T and C, those are fitting together in all four possibilities, but then you can have T not being there, in which case you just have green, C not being there, in which case you just have black. And the thing on the side is just CT, the, the parity. You got it. The parity offer. Okay, so I think I got it. Okay. And so this is just combinatorially teasing this apart. And you said something very important, Tom. Um, like here, on top, it would be the T's are constant, but the C's are running through the possibilities. You know, they're on, they square to plus one, I'm sorry, or they're blank, or they square to minus one. And then it could be here, T is constant to negative one, squaring to negative one, but and C is running through the possibilities. But if you go left and right, it's the C that's in charge. You know, C is constant here and C is constant here. So you have these two different ways of looking at it. And basically that's going to relate the um, two different ways of looking at the Clifford algebras. So we'll, we'll um, I mean, we can even sneak back here and see, like, see this zero is centered here. So here the C is constant around that zero, right? And it's constant around the four on the other side. Whereas with this zero, the time reversal is constant and it's constant on the other side. And so they're off by two, basically. But this is a way of, you know, having them fit together like that. So that's an interesting clue to think about. We're still in the stage of collecting clues. Now, <clears throat> just to kind of go through this, we've talked a lot about this. This is an eight cycle and then there's a two cycle. And just to review for people who uh, haven't seen Clifford algebras, uh, but the way I think about it is basically it's a uh, super version of the binomial theorem. So you have at each level, you can have, let's say in the top level, you have no generators, uh, like no choices. In the first level, you have one possible generator, E sub one. And typically like, so E sub one can square like either to plus one or to minus one. Uh, and typically you work uh, often with, they all square to plus one or they all square to minus one. So, so the complex numbers, like if this squares to minus one, then you got two dimensions and you have a, this could be the role of the imaginary number I, and this could be the real dimension, let's say. so. If you don't, you, so now when you, on the, this level, you have um, two choices of generators. And so you have four possibilities. You could have no generator, or you could have E1 by itself, or E2 by itself, or you could have their product, E1, E2. And so that is what you need for the quaternions. Uh, and we'll see, like, if E1 squares to negative 1 and E2 squares to negative 1, that'd be like I and J. It turns out their product also squares to negative 1, and that could be the K. So uh, that's that. But, and then for 
if you have the third row, that'll be like quaternions plus quaternions. So that's no longer a division uh, algebra. But that's a sum of division algebra. That's a super division algebra. And then you have um, one uh, way of choosing nothing, no generator. You could have three ways of choosing one generator, which could be E1 or E2 or E3. You have three ways of having pairs, and then you have one way of having all three. This one is sometimes called the pseudoscalar or like the volume. Uh, because it's pseudoscalar, in a sense, it's kind of like one. Uh, in many ways, it it, it kind of uh, be a, very similar to one. So you have like sometimes a symmetry from top to down. Uh, let's see. Any comments here? Any questions? You're you're saying that you're saying that this um, this is any anything of this form is isomorphic as a is a super division algebra to H plus H. Is that what you're saying, or is H plus H? Um, let's example? see. That's in the case of when these square to negative one. If they oh. all square to negative one, yeah. So that's just an example on the left. H plus well, H. Is, that's the presumption here. I'm typically working with squaring to negative one, but but sometimes we'll be looking at things squaring to positive one, right? But this is kind of like to make it more concrete. And what is this? So these these things have concrete meaning, and um, as you know, but I'll mention it to people who don't. Um, when you keep building this, you get like, then the next one would be, um, I think it's, uh, you get two by two matrices of quaternions, and then you get larger and larger matrices. But when you get to the eighth level, it's, um, in a certain sense, it's information wise uh, or algebraic structure wise, it's isomorphic to this top level. Uh, the structure basically just starts to repeat. Um, and that's because, um, uh, well, it's through what's called Morita equivalence, and it's basically about category theory, and it's basically saying that if you look at the representations of, of these uh, Clifford algebras, then those representations uh, and the, um, if, you, if you look at uh, the category of representations, let's say the morphisms, the intertwiners between the representations, they look exactly the same for the big matrix object and for, let's say, these real numbers, and then it just repeats periodically. So that's something I'll have to learn more about. I won't talk about today, but that's uh, back here. And just another thing to remind. So like I was saying, um, they square typically to negative one. It could be all to positive one or it could be mixed, let's say. Um, they're anti-commuting. So E1, E2 is going to be the negative of E2, E1. And so then you can do calculations given that information. So let's say E1, E2 squared. Well, you write that out, E1, E2, E1, E2. And then you can swap the E2, E1. So then that would be E. So because you swap it, you put in a negative sign. Yeah. Negative E1, E1, E2, E2 equals negative 1. So if these are squaring to negative 1, both then negative, negative, negative is negative 1. If they're squaring to positive 1, that'll also give a negative one. If one was negative and one was positive, well, then you'd have positive one. So you have to be careful uh, to keep track of all that. But basically, here, if you're squaring, it's negative one. So like I was saying, if i and j square to negative one, and you have their product, i, j, then in Clifford algebra, it, that will also square to negative one. Uh, and then for the third one, e1, e2, e3, again, you can write it out. You can take this E1 and you can hop it over twice. So then that doesn't affect the sign. And then you have E2, E3, E2, E3. But we know that that's negative 1. So you get negative E1, E1. So now it goes to positive 1. And if you keep going, uh, there's actually a four fourfold pattern. I think it's like negative 1, negative 1, plus 1, plus 1, negative 1, negative 1. We've looked at that before. So now this is the 7 plus 3 equals 10. I'll spend a little bit more time on this. Um, and this uh, is very nicely written up by Todd Trimble, who I'm in touch with. And so that's really great. He's uh, at, uh, uh, he went to Rutgers University. Now, I'm not sure where he is now, but um, where, where actually Gregory Moore actually taught, uh, which is interesting. Um, so, others, um, yes. so we're looking at a period, periodicity of Clifford algebras here. Yes. And... Um, but there's a there's a dual periodicity of Lie groups that um, these Clifford algebras are are kind of dual to. In other words, the the subgroups of the orthogonal group that commute with these Clifford algebras, yes, themselves 
form a form a bot periodicity of H cycle bot periodicity. Am, am I am I correct in thinking that way that we're looking here at the the Clifford algebra point of view, but there's also a lead group point of view, right? Um, exactly. So maybe just even to kind of jump ahead um, and jump back. Um, here are all those Lee group quotients. Oh yeah, okay. Metric spaces, right. and actually they're they're kind of like providing the context. Um, and so the Hamiltonians, if you think of it physically, are elements of this. So this is kind of like basically saying what are the possible Hamiltonians, and we were reading from a paper by Gregory Moore of um, no, we were reading by a paper from by. Um, Stone, yeah. Stone, and Chu, others. Roy from the yeah. University of Illinois, and so uh, and they're mathematical physicists. Uh, I would say they're uh, studying topological insulators and they're studying what's called the tenfold way. And so they were really trying to understand how this relates to um, the CPT symmetry, and I couldn't quite understand how they were doing it. Uh, I mean, we understood some of what they were doing here, but like, how does that connect to charge conjugation, time reversal, et cetera? I found this other paper by Gregory Moore where he um, made that basically uh, more explicit, uh, but in a different way. So to go back to the very beginning where we were, so, Stone, Chu, Roy are talking about this eight cycle, but this here, the red one, that's what's being talked about by um, Gregory Moore of uh, Rutgers University. And so I'm trying to link those two. So I've been spending a couple months reading this paper, struggling with it, but getting this far. And so um, when you get to here, this is what's kind of connected with that. But this is a slightly different thing. This is uh, super division algebras, uh, which includes division algebras as a subcase. So you have the three division algebras, C, H, and R. But so these are like the zero cases, so to speak. Like, so R in the, for the real Clifford algebras, R is just R. If you add a single generator, let's say this E that squares to negative one, this is like the complex numbers here. And so you can think of the complex numbers as a superdivision algebra where it's like R plus a copy of R that's been multiplied by this generator. Does that make sense? Right, yeah, I, I think so. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so um, superdivision algebra uh, may be basically to say like a division algebra is, um, if I got this right, I mean, it's almost like a field. So a field would be like the complete arithmetical toolkit. Uh, it's got addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So that would include, let's say, the rational numbers, the real numbers, uh, and things like that, complex numbers. It's commutative. Division algebra doesn't have to be uh, commutative, so we can include the quaternions. Um, but basically, we run out of uh, division algebras um, uh, in the sense that uh, it's so strict, there's not that many possibilities. And what happened in around the 70s or so in physics was that um, they were looking for a unified uh, theory that would unite uh, special relativity, let's say, and uh, quantum um, symmetries. So space-time has 10 symmetries or... Who has its collection of symmetries, I'll just say. And then um, quantum has internal symmetries, so to speak. And what they ran into was that when they tried to unite those symmetries comprehensively and get some kind of mathematical structure, they ended up with a no-go theorem, saying that it's just not possible. Okay, so I would have to learn more about that. So it was no-go. So then they said, well, maybe we don't really need to have division algebras, maybe instead we could have uh, what's called superdivision algebras, which is more relaxed. And so for division algebras, um, every non-zero element has to have an inverse, 
which means it doesn't, there's no zero divisors. You never have a situation where like a times b equals zero unless either a is zero or b is zero. Well, they say, well, if we relax that, what if we had like a pair, and this is called like Z2 graded, where you could say, we're gonna have even elements and odd elements. And then let's say, um, even times even is even, even times odd is odd, odd times even is odd, odd times odd is even. They kind of work back and forth, but so every element is a combination of these. Now, if you have pure elements though, where like they say homogeneous elements that are only belonging to one or the other, well, those are division algebras. Only if you mix them, do you get something that's possibly gonna have a zero divisors, you know, where 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 they they cancel out and give you zero. So an example, I guess, would be like something like one plus i times one plus i, or let's say one plus i times one minus i. Yeah, one plus i times mm -hmm. is what gives two. Gives two. Anyways, I'm not going to figure it out. One plus but i there's, plus one plus i okay. gives. I do want to go back. So in terms of this odd or even, though, I do want to go back here and just say that uh, this can be given a grading in terms of odd or even. So, and you can do it by diagonal, let's say. So uh, the ones are considered even, that's like zero power, but it's basically by power. So if the, if the power is one, then this would have, uh, that's odd. So that'd be an odd degree. If the power is two, that's an even degree. If the power is three, that's a odd degree. So going down diagonals, you get odd or even. And there you have the same logic. Like if an odd power times an odd power will give you an even power hmm. and so on. Now, if you have like E1 squares to negative one, well, that will give you, well, negative one is, an, is a scalar. So that's considered basically zero power. That's an even. So squaring something by itself will give you a even, you know, if it's odd, odd times odd is even. So that's an example. So basically we're using this to, um, to the Z2 grading. And so this could be C again, like if you have a, co a, a copy of the complexes with another copy and you add this new generator, let's say um, J, let's say. So C has an I in it, but if you have a J here, then you're gonna get C, but you're gonna get I times J. So you get one times j is j, i times j is k, and you're gonna get the whole quaternions, okay? But you'll get them with a particular grading. So this way, if you do it, um, uh, the i will be considered even because it's part of the c here. Only the j will be considered odd. You see, if you, if you have this grading here where you're saying that the first uh, copy is even, the second copy is odd. So you have to become very attentive to the grading that you're using. Um, so for example, by the time you get to here, I think this H turns out to be even, and there is no odd component. And if you go this way, you also get H where it's even and it is no odd component. Um, so I have to think about that and I have to learn about that and write that up. But basically, so does this kind of make sense what this Clifford algebra is? Like this would be yeah. one generator squares to one uh, and, and then you have another generator. It's, well, actually, these uh, aren't really Clifford algebras. These are super division super, algebras. Super division. Yeah. Uh, so the question is how general, it, it, you're giving an example of a, of a cycle of super division algebras kind of a, mm -hmm. on, on the left. Uh, but I'd like to know, like, how general is this? Is, I mean, you're giving one example here, but you're saying they all, uh, there can be other much more elaborate examples, right? That are well. So this is a complete classification. Uh, there's ten. See, so in the same way that there's three division algebras, right? There's yeah. ten super division algebras, and so but what happens is that we'll go, we'll go through that. They're all isomorphic right. to the ones that you're showing here. They're all. They're all. They all have to be isomorphic to the ones I'm showing here. So this is it. And this is it. So when they talk about supersymmetry in physics, this is the kind of thing they're talking about. And so they're talking about fermions and bosons. Let's see. So bosons and fermions. So bosons would be even, and fermions would be odd. Now, for wondrous wisdom, you see, what I realized was that 
we have the same information in two different forms. And the second one has this symbol, right? Like this kind of like marker. So I said, wow, that's like what I'm looking for, like the unconscious and the conscious. So the unconscious would be raw experience. And then this means it's reflected experience. And we have two copies of the same thing. And we'll, as we'll see on the next slide, or the slide after that, we'll have an automorphism going back and forth. That will be like the consciousness, you know, that kind of like mediates between the two, that makes sure that they're equal. Okay? So that's what we need. Now in here, it's really R plus zero. You know, this is just even. This is just even H plus zero, C plus zero. So we kind of get the picture here, though. We'll go to the next slide. Is that fine? And so this is what it looks like in Todd Trimble's um, note that he wrote 19 years ago and that uh, John Bias published at his website. And so that was very useful for me. So he makes it a little bit more specific, uh, saying, OK, like what these are squaring to. And I wonder if I got this right. Yeah, see, so it goes minus, minus, plus here. Plus, plus, minus here. So these details matter. And then there's this anti-commutativity here, this E with the I in the C. So that's called anti-linear in a certain sense. So like, you know, if you take an I and you pass it over the E, it goes to its conjugate. Whereas uh, in this case, it's commuting with IJK of the quaternions. And so here, there's commuting with IJK. Here, it's antilinear. So now let's look through the argument. So I think we'll go through this just because it's instructive. Um, this is by Todd Trimble. And the point is here that, I don't know if uh, Thomas can't see this, and I'll have trouble moving this, but... Uh, it's okay. Okay, but what this says is basically EA equals A prime E. So... Um, what that means is that we have this marker E and we have elements in our algebra, right? So A over here could be any one of these, uh, anyone, it could be R or it could be C or it could be H. Those are the possibilities for A, basically. There's three possibilities for A. And we know that there's an automorphism like from A to A. Like because of this even odd thing, we know that we have to get the same division algebra twice. OK, and we also know that multiplying by this generator will function. It'll set up an automorphism if we ask ourselves the question, you know, because these don't, things don't necessarily commute. They don't necessarily commute. So if you have the algebra element and then this uh, E, well, that should you should be able to map that to the other way around, you know, like. Taking the generator and multiplying by the algebra should be mappable to taking the algebra and multiplying by the generator. That means that there's a map from A to A prime where E A equals A prime E. Am I making sense? Kind of? Kind of. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. They... Okay, you got me, but... Nope. It should be written up for me to understand, and that's... Yeah. Um... Yeah, I mean, it's all... Uh, we've been talking about this now for months, so I think it's... it. I think I, yeah, and I didn't, um, yeah. I, I didn't, um, I mean, I myself would probably, I would want to see, like, why is that? But, uh, so I can't go from scratch, but basically, like, if you know, here, let's look at this. I have R plus RE. Let's say that that's the same as R plus ER, just for the sake of. Uh, what does ER mean? Well, I have a real number times a generator here, mm -hmm. right? And they commute. Good. They're well, they don't necessarily commute. That's the point. But so that there should be a map. Don't reals commute with everything? You can see these maps here. I think maybe these maps are more clear. Like, see, so C times E is equal to, if I have a complex number times E, and I want to write it the other way around, I have to conjugate. So it's antilinear. That this is conjugation is something that I don't see, but I mean, you tell it, okay. I tell it, I just say that, but the point being, first of all, before we even get this far, first we have to have a map. So we have to say, we have to kind of agree, you know, and I'm not proving this, I have to wonder how, this is a good question, how to prove it. But if you have C plus CE is one way to define this, 
Well, maybe to do it this way. This is isomorphic to the Clifford algebra. It shouldn't matter if the E is in front or in back, right? That's not going to affect the isomorphism. Does that make sense? Well, it will be a different one. It'll be a different isomorphism, but they'll all be isomorphic to each other, right? So if I can show that, I mean, we basically have been showing here, right? Like, so like Clifford, maybe just do a simple case. The Clifford algebra, which has one generator, E sub one, that squares to negative one, right? That's isomorphic to R plus R E. Basically, it's like the imaginary number, right? Like it's functioning like the imaginary number. So I can make an isomorphism between this and that. Now, I could also do an isomorphism with it the other way around, where it's R plus E R. Okay. Now, then there must be an isomorphism between R E and E R. They've got to, they have the same information in two different ways. Mm -hmm. But there could be now possibly several automorphisms. Now, it turns out with the real numbers, there's only one way. Okay. But we have to look at those possibilities. Okay. And so, it turns out there's not a lot of possibilities. In fact, there's very few possibilities. Uh, and so we only get, um, it's actually only, there's only practically one possible in each case. So we're going to run through them. So like if, if the algebra is R and he goes here, we can adjust E so that E squared, uh, which is this uh, inner product, that's how he's arguing it, is either negative one or one. Okay, so in each case, it can be negative one or one. The corresponding division superalgebras occur at one o'clock and seven o'clock on the superbar clock. Okay, that's that's just showing where they're located. But basically, with R, I think the point is that there's only one automorphism between R to R. Is that right? Um, there's only one isomorphism. Let's say, yeah. From up to uh, isomorphism, there's only one map. Yeah, I mean, you could multiply by any any positive real number or negative real number, right? And that gives you a... Um, okay, right. But oh, you no, can no, multiply no. By that, any... It's not a, it's not a, it's, it's not a multiplicative auto, um, homomorphism, though. So um, that might be true. It says, uh, we can easily enumerate up to isomorphism, right? Like, so, like, the maps from R to R, they're going to be multiplicative, you're saying, right? Yeah. You're just so maybe you put in a negative sign there. Maybe you make it seven times bigger. Well, but then you can reverse it. Then. Pardon? Uh, that wouldn't be multiplicative. Um, oh, you know what? R has to go to, like identity has to go to identity. That's the deal. Right. So you can't have it multiplicative. Okay. Okay. So you can't send it to negative one either because identity has to go to identity, right? Oh. Okay. So once you send the identity to the entity, then R goes to R. That's good. Just shows my level of knowledge here. We're getting there. Okay. So now, with complexes, though, there's two R automorphisms. Okay. One is conjugation, okay? Right. And then they have this thing where they have this inner product times E equals E times the inner product. So that means that this has to be real. So if, if the automorphism is conjugation... Okay, anyways, so the real number can be just sort of equals to negative one or uh, no, just negative. negative one. Okay. Or positive one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um so, so this one is conjugation. So what is that saying? That's saying that here you see it's like this saying it's E I equals minus I E. It's conjugation is the uh, is the one you need in order to have the quaternions. And, and because the E is functioning as what? Let's see. There's an I in C. There's an I in C. E is like J, basically. I times J is K. Uh, so you have J and K are coming from here. So if E is functioning like J, J squared is negative 1, as you would expect for the quaternions. J times I equals minus I times J. You need that for the quaternions, right? They have to go in the opposite direction. So that's the one you need for the quaternions. Now here's the, oh, now for the identity automorphism, so there's another automorphism C, which is instead of going to the conjugate, you could go to the identity. So, the, so are, we, are, just, are, we, are we in the process of proving that the only way to get that page, uh, the page before this, yes. is these possibilities? In other words, 
We're, we're walking through it. The point we're is walking, that there's very few. If you have a bigraded algebra that where there's right. a concept of even and odd, then we're just walking through the possibilities and we're limiting them to what you just showed us in that in that clock. In right. That. This is the nitty gritty, but I think it's very. I found it very instructive, and I think I think we all find it instructive because it it's so it's basically saying like, and I'm you know I only picked this part, but. I think another period is like, you have to have two copies of the same algebra. Otherwise, the even and odd won't work, basically. Okay. So once you realize that, and you don't have a lot of division algebras to choose from, and then as you can see, they don't have a lot of automorphism. The real only had one. The complexes only had two. And now, um, so for the other one, it's the identity, which is just taking one to one, right? So it's completely dull. So it goes, this gives the super algebra CE where E commutes with elements in C. Okay, so this is the one over here. That's this one here. So the one in this clock is uh, conjugation. That's the automorphism. The identity automorphism, which just sends one to one and I to I, right? Like that'll be this one. And so... um. Now we have H. So you go, an R automorphisms H are given by H goes to, and then you conjugate by X, where those are X is in the quaternions, okay? So those are the automorphisms. So then H E is gonna be E H prime, where you know H goes to H prime. Well then, so H prime looks like this, E X H X inverse. And then what they notice is they go, well, look, that means you can put the X over on this side. You're going to get H E X equals E X H. But that means E X commutes with absolutely every element of H. And then they're saying we can assume without loss of generality that the automorphism is the identity. Okay, because if it's commuting with everything, I guess they're saying, um, then it's like they're all equivalent. Mm. I'd have to maybe walk that through, but, but that's the argument. And so then the prop, so basically saying like, yeah, there's uncountably many, but they're all basically looking the same. Okay. So they're, they're not distinct. They're all equivalent. The properties of the pairing guarantee that H times this uh, uh, inner product equals inner product times H for all H element of quaternions. So this is real. And again, we can adjust E so that, which means, you know, there's no I, J, K in that. There's just uh, this inner product is just going to be scaled. So we can scale it so that E is either one or minus one. And then this occurs in the super bar clock. So that's just saying that there's only one for R. There's only two for C. For H, there's only one because they're all equivalent. And then the other ones were the even ones. And that's it. So that's, I didn't, you know, that's just kind of give you a spirit of the argument. But does that kind of... Makes sense, or I, have, I mean, I'd have to go through and reproduce it in detail myself. Yeah, I, I can. It's, it's believe it's plausible. You know. Okay, it's plausible. So I believe. I mean, I want to learn it, but I mean, I, yeah. I trust in Todd Trimble, but I, yeah. but only you know, I, I'll have to wean myself from that trust. But now I noticed a very uh, curious metaphysical uh, point this morning that this is the Chomsky hierarchy of automata, like so automata theory. Do you studied some automata theory, John? Of course, yes? A little bit. Yeah, because you have background. Um, so are you familiar with the Chomsky hierarchy? Um, you've mentioned it before, but I, I never, you know, I never studied okay. it. Okay. So I just took one course in automata theory, but uh, I, I, I learned a lot. But they went through these different levels of the power of the machines. And this is something that Chomsky noted, the famous linguist in the back in the 50s, um, when, when computers were mostly on paper. So uh, there's finite automata, which have no memory, uh, but there's pushdown automata, which kind of like have a cafeteria tray type of memory, or where they, you know, and then they generate context-free grammars. Then there's Turing machines that can write on a tape, uh, but they could be, let's say, what's called linear bounded. But then there could be unbounded Turing machines. And so if you look at like the rules that you can get to generate stuff, um, 
what I noticed when I saw this, H E X equals E X H, uh, you could put an arrow here where that equal sign is. If there's, if you have variables H E X, and you allow that to generate E X H, what it means, it means the combination E X, E can transport X across a whole string of H's. So like, let's say there's a whole string of H's, E is transporting the X all the way across. And that is super powerful in computation because it means that you can have like a scratch board that's, you know, far away and you can calmly do some calculation and then you can transport back, let's say, what you did. So, so instead of just having a stack of trays, let's say, where you, you know, can only take the top one off or maybe put a new tray on, this is saying, no, you can have a whole uh, piece of uh, scratch paper uh, off to the side that you can be moving around and, uh, and uh, doing computations on. So that is this. So then I go, well, would this be the for the pushdown automaton? You need something like E goes to CEC. Or another way to say it is like your generator goes to a left parentheses, E times a right parentheses, you know, all the strings. So if you want to generate combinations of left and right parentheses that are correctly balanced so that every left parentheses comes with a right parentheses, you would have a rule like this. You'd have a rule like this. You'd also have a rule like E goes to EE, -E, where let's say one E can become two E's, which is basically similar in spirit here. Uh, so where do I get this? Well, you see, if you go back to what he was saying, CE equals EC bar. That's what he was saying here. Well, we can go back here. EI equals negative IE. So E times the complex number is going to be complex number bar, the conjugate, times E, right? So if I multiply by C on both time, sides, well, if C bar times C is one, then I'll get C here. Otherwise I could scale it and get C times some kind of like constant, let's say, which may be even better, but I'm gonna get E by itself and it's gonna be uh, equal to, let's say C E D or C E C. Does that make sense, John? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sort of following so you're building so up. So then that's a really cool coincidence, right? Like for me, like wow, like and so then this could, yeah, could so... code a finite automata. Well, you need to be able to encode stuff like this. Well, then we have R E equals E R. So that's only gonna be true if if uh E is let's say one, let's say. But if E is one, and let's say this is all up to scalars, right? Like then Okay, you can have as many ones as you want. Maybe you can have ones of different kinds. I don't know, but but it's it's within the realm of of argument. And then for the unbounded Turing machine, you need the what makes the most powerful machine is when you're able to collapse your generator. So you're able to do all kinds of computations, and then you destroy the evidence, and no one can work back. It's irreversible. So that's the kind of way where you can get like the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, where you just can't go backwards because uh, you can't reverse things, let's say, because you have uh, things ending up in the same place um, or just disappearing. Mm. And see, I think that could be related to this here where the H becomes just um, uh, even. There's no odd here. The odd one goes away. It disappears. So the H is even here. Um, I'd have to think about that, but that's... I just was inspired about this. Any comments on this or not? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm just wondering that is the, I mean, it, if you if you're talking about a unbounded Turing machine in the end, you're talking about generating, I assume, arbitrary strings. Um, no, there's a it, there's there's a limit on the power of these Turing machines. Um, I threw in the word unbounded, I guess, uh, just to kind of distinguish it. So it would just be an ordinary Turing machine uh, without a bound. Um, you mean but, without um, a bound on memory or without a bound on? Uh, well, they don't have bounds on. See, so I forget what linear bounded means. Um, what kind of bound uh, that's coming from? That might be. Like a linear bounded Turing machine might be 
maybe it's like a bound on the size of the tape. Or you know what I think one kind of bound it is, is like it's allowed to read, but it's not allowed to write over, let's say. It's not allowed to write. So it can move left and right, let's say. See, it has some kind of severe bounds like that. Like it can't write over things. Okay. I think that's one version. There's many versions that are uh, like of the same level or power. Okay. So I'll leave it at that. So we've gone, we're back to where we started from. We've kind of like looked at the three different ways, you know, like what does it mean to have it eight plus two equals 10? What does it mean to have it nine plus one equals 10? You know, where nine is three times three. What does it mean to have it uh, seven plus three equals 10? All these different ways, it's very rich. But how are they related? And we kind of started to see like, oh, the way that the time reversal and the charge conjugation have this very um, beautiful pattern where they switch off in terms of like who's in charge and who's changing, who's constant and who's changing. That's somehow mediating these two different ways of looking at the Clifford algebras. And those two ways, you know, one you and I have talked about much before uh, and studied, been studying about like, well, you have the same linear complex structure and you keep applying it. Uh, in each case, you make sure that those structures are mutually anti-commuting. So you're getting and you're imposing commutativity on what's left, let's say. And it becomes a more and more restricted uh, Lie group. And so you get this embedding that goes deeper, deeper, deeper. And at each level, you have a quotient. And that quotient is a space. And that quotient space, uh, that symmetric space, uh, uh, basically tells you about Hamiltonians. Uh, each point, like let's say, is considered a Hamiltonian. So that's one way to say these are like the Clifford algebra. And so the Clifford algebra, these are the generators of the Clifford algebra, are these complex linear complex structures. And so... They're kind of like uh, this framework for this embedding, for this uh, you know stuff that ends up being commutative. The other Clifford algebra is kind of like building up uh, the structure, which could be real or complex or quaternionic. And here, like it was either like going this way down or going up, and you end up with a four. So you don't end up at eight. You don't end up at zero. It's kind of like plus four and minus four happen to equal each other. So trying to get a better understanding, like what does it mean to be imposing this structure? But basically the first, if you want to look at like, well, what corresponds to these J's, the first generator here is going to be the charge conjugation, whether it's a squaring to plus one or squaring to minus one. The second one you'll add will be complex number I times the charge conjugation. And then the third one you would add would be complex number I times charge uh, times time reversal, which is parity. So I'm just starting to try to understand what that means, but um, let's go see what we can learn. So I'll go through some various themes. And one theme uh, is interesting because uh, it starts to talk about unconscious versus conscious in my models. But basically, we're going to make these distinctions. Um, and like you've been seeing, things squared to plus one or things squared to minus one. What is that all about? Well, it's coming from this um, A to the fourth equals one. Uh, in certain algebraic situations, what's the solution for that? And so there's two solutions um, uh, that depend on A squared. So A, if A to the fourth equals one, where one is the identity in your group. Well, A squared could possibly also be that identity. Okay, so uh, that's one possibility. The other one could be that it's not, that A squared's not the identity, and then we write it as negative one. Um, so that's certainly the case. Um, well, anyways, that's the notation we'll be using. Uh, but certainly like in the case of the real numbers, it would be negative one. Uh, if A to the fourth equals one, those would be the two possibilities, but we can think of that more broadly. Okay, so if a squared equals one, well, then you only have two elements. So it's a two element group, it's Z2. And we could say that one is the world, the state of the world, and a is the unconscious. And so like you have an organism, it has an unconscious, let's say it has some kind of model, and you go back and forth and back and forth like a switch. But if a squared equals negative one, here's negative one, 
Well, then a squared is to negative 1. a cubed would be negative a. a to the fourth would be 1. You're going around z4. And what it's like for the, what I'm modeling, it's like you have these filters in between the one and the unconscious, going forward and going backward. So it's kind of like somebody is able to look at what's being perceived from the world as it comes in, and somebody's able to look at what's going out, maybe an action that you're taking on the world. And so consciousness, the idea is that has these two windows. So that's kind of a curious, that's a helpful model because basically it's saying consciousness is kind of like looking at the side and it's um, consciousness distinguishes, are you going in or are you going out? It comes in pairs in the same way that like imaginary numbers come in pairs, you know, with their conjugates, I and I, I bar, let's say. So that's just the model that's kind of built in with this. And this is uh, the the, the, the basis for the algebra we'll talk about. And so in the Moore paper, everything is built up in terms of these um, group extensions and the CT groups. So like we said, if you have two switches, Z2 cross Z2, there will be five possible subgroups. And so again, like if you, know, the, if you have these symmetries, uh, charge conjugation and time reversal, you may only have some of them. So then that's you would only look at a subgroup because you may not include the other one, let's say. So the U would be the group that you're interested in that's a subgroup of Z2 cross Z2, which is so one of these five subgroups, possibly trivial. U of one is the circle. That's the unitary group uh, of degree one. And G is how to integrate that. So metaphysically, it's very exciting when you start to realize uh, what this is about because it's integrating a circle with a pair of switches. Well, I think of a circle as modeling recurring activity, and I think of a pair of switches as modeling structure, like these four levels of knowledge, like how and what would make a switch and why and whether would make a switch. And so um, this why is kind of like waiting. Well, when how becomes what, then why can become whether. So... Uh, so there's like this kind of like switching, double switching model. And this is where I want to bring up um, the architect, Christopher Alexander. He asks like, what makes a building come alive? Uh, why are modern buildings so deadly? You know, they suck the life out of you because they're built out of blueprints. Then because but built by people who never were actually on site, never lived inside the buildings they drew. Whereas in the old days, people would build things physically, they would lay down the patterns and optimize the patterns as they built. So it was custom made uh, on the spot. Uh, uh, everything was adjusted as they built uh, based on rules of thumbs and patterns. And every pattern had activity and structure. So like if you wash the dishes once, it doesn't matter how you do it. But if you wash them every day, the clean water will be above, the dirty water will be below, uh, the soap will be within reach, the window will be in front of you, which is to say recurring activity evokes structure. And structure channels activity. You know, if you lock this door and you have two keys that are needed, well, you're probably not going to use that door very much. And so that's going to affect the whole activity. So this, when I read it, I say, oh, it's relating the recurring activity with the structure. And it's saying there's only very few ways that can be related. Like, you know, we we're saying, oh, there's only 10 superdivision algebras. So there's very few combinations. And so these will be the context. That's what metaphysically those divisions of everything are doing. They're giving you the context for how the unconscious conscious consciousness could be operating. So that's very uh, good. And maybe just one thing to notice, like, when you have a group extension like this, uh, these maps are uh, set up so that the image of one map is the kernel of the next map, which means that if you map twice, you end up to the trivial thing, which is like zero or identity or whatever. So the fact that what this ends up meaning, it means that this circle is embedded injectively into G. There's a perfect copy of it. And now this is surjective. G is surjective here. This map is surjective. That means that um, 
everything here is going to everything here is going to get mapped to by something so what we know is like the elements in g let's say like let's say this is z2 well that non identity element is going to get mapped to something like an a okay and these circles are going to be mapped to z so you're basically going to have stuff like a z and an a and combinations and the question is how can they get integrated the crucial thing to know is that when you square A, well, what happens to the map over here? G of A squared is going to be 1. Because G of A is, let's say, not 1, but, you know, squaring not 1 is going to get you 1 if this is, let's say, Z2. Or even if it's Z2 cross Z2. You know, you square anything, you're going to get 1. That means that A squared is uh, in the kernel this kernel is equal to the image of this map. That means that it's in the image of the circle. That means it looks like some z. So you'll get like equation a squared equals z. And that's how we can do the algebra. Any comments or thoughts at this point? So we, we've been over this a couple of times. So it's... it's Yeah, you've seen this. Tragic. Yeah. I mean, it's, so then, it's the basic... Yeah, and so then I've shown paradigm, both of those. paradigm and group group theory, where you um, you break up a group into a direct or semi-direct product, right? Mm -hmm. And am I am I correct there? Is that the is that the well correct language for group so theory? This, let's see what this is happening. Um, uh, and I'm language wise, I'm weak here, but basically, what's happening here? Um, and this is just a summary of the algebra. When you have A and you have Z, and you know that this A squared is part of, you know, this equal to some Z, and you're looking at how these things can come together, well, A times Z times A inverse is going to act like a automorphism on Z. I think that's what you know. And so there's not a lot of automorphisms, it turns out, if this is going to be a circle. So it turns out it's either going to be Z mm. or going to be Z inverse. If it's Z, um, then it will be AZ equals ZA. That's commutative. And then it'll be, like you said, the direct product in that case. So there's one commutative case. It'll be direct product. And this will be kind of, this is kind of like linear, so to speak. You know, like, let's say Z is a complex number. It's, it's you know, represented by the circle. A is this generator, A times Z is the same as Z times A, that's called like complex linear. Whereas in this case, A, Z, A inverse, if that gives you Z inverse, well, that's not commutative because A, Z equals Z inverse A and Z and Z inverse generally is not the same. You know, these are, these are angles in a circle. So, um, uh, but what this, you can, you can work with this. You can say, well, let's look at what happens when, let's say, z squared equals a and plug that in and whatever. And you'll get an equation a to the fourth equals one that I talked about. And then you'll get the two solutions. So these are like, I think these are semi-direct products, as you said. Um, yeah, because this is a normal subgroup and then this is a quotient group and then right. this is a, that'll be a semi-direct product. So you have two semi-direct products and these are called the pin groups of, of degree two. And this one is called a, this is plus and this is minus. And so this is it. And then just geometrically, the way I think of it, like, like I think of the circle as spinning like a pancake, let's say. And so you can spin around the pancake or let's say you can flip the pancake over. So like that's how I think of the A as, let's say, flipping. And if you the question is, what happens if you flip twice? You flip and then you flip. Well, physically what happens is you get the dihedral case. So you basically get the case where um, you're back to where you started, whatever angle. No, you have the opposite angle, I guess. Let's see, I'd be careful. But there's another way to do it where like, no, if, if, if you just flip and flip, you're back to where you started. It's the physical world. But you could live in an alternate universe where like if you flip and then you flip back, you've rotated around 180 degrees. That would be this dicyclic universe, let's say. So that would be odd to us, but for other people, that would be normal. And it's kind of like an electron spin. That's what electron maybe would find kind of uh, meaningful. So that's a theme. And then this is another theme to look at phi x representations. So to say, 
when we have a group representation, we can insist that the group representation have a particular form uh, where we're basically breaking things down into two by two matrices and insisting on one of these four forms that everything has to be either even or odd. So the top two are even and the bottom two are odd. And then they have to be either linear or anti-linear. So linear would mean like that they're compatible with the complex numbers. So that'd be this one, which is the identity. And that'd be this one, just like the number I as a two by two matrix. It's a rotation by 90 degrees or they're anti-linear. So like if you reflect, this is like a conjugation, let's say uh, you fix maybe the real dimension and you flip the other dimension, that'd be a conjugation. Or you could swap the two. That's like multiplying these two together. So that's, um, um, that's also anti-linear, that's anti-linear odd. So these are the possibilities. And it turns out that when we have these uh, quantum symmetries, Basically, they're running through these possibilities. So time reversal is saying you fix one dimension, you flip the other one. So it's kind of like taking position as fixed, but flipping momentum. So you flip the direction. Um, charge conjugation would swap them both. Uh, and parity would be the usual, uh, like I. See, so parity is odd, but linear. It's it's a product of these two because it's a even times odd is odd, but antilinear times antilinear is linear. So that's how this algebra works. What's also very curious is that these two square to one, you know, one negative one, this will square to one, and this will square to one, but this one squares to negative one. So it's very interesting. If you multiply these two things that square to one, but you're going to get something that's of power order uh, you know, it's order four, because this is i, so it's kind of squared to negative one, and then negative i, and then, then one. That's curious. So, but these are the four things, and this is how the operators become important. And this is, again, metaphysical intuition. It becomes to say, well, what is this breaking down? And so the way I think about it is that, well, the position is absolute, the momentum is relative. So, one dimension is absolute, the other is relative. So when we have charge conjugation, we're swapping absolute and relative. And I think that this works sometimes as like laying down perspectives. So in that case, it's kind of like swapping what's absolute, what's relative. Parity here is uh, is the product of both. So maybe that's all. The, any any thoughts on this or intuitions you, on this? So what do, you, what do you mean by position is absolute, but momentum is relative? Um, Aren't they both? Um, I mean, uh, like, well, you're not talking about relativity theory here. You're talking about something else. Well, I'm just talking about like time reversal. If you reverse the direction of time, right? What does that mean to reverse the direction of time? So, well, it means that uh, you have a position. You know, the position coordinates stay the same. Right. But the momentum coordinates switch from positive to negative and from negative to positive. Okay. So, you know, and you get to choose which one it is. But in that case, like position is like an absolute frame. It's saying we're going to stay the same regardless. Right. The other one says we're relative. We're going to switch. Okay. Okay. So that's just a mental, that's just a mental picture. Um, but that's what I read into this. And that's, I think, that's what we're looking for is to be able to read into things like this. Does that kind of make sense? I mean, to some, to some extent, it... it... Um, I mean, I'm sort of taking your word for it. it. It, I mean, how does this? You're saying that this is a particular representation of of the previous or the the slide. The, this, let's see, uh, which slide? Well, we'll get to, I think we'll get to more okay. and it'll be more right. clear. Okay. But but the point being that this T and C and CT, right? Like where are they coming from? What are they all about? Like who who thought of those? Well, they come up in physics. Okay. Uh, but they're coming up in these two by two matrices, basically. Okay. And those two by two matrices have stripped down everything. And when you strip everything down, like there's not much left. But what's left is this kind of distinction between keeping things fixed or not, Right. So this distinction that in you know ordinary human language we'd say well there's an absolute and there's a relative right like 
that stays like the meter that's there i think um the other thing that comes up here is this idea that oh i've talked to you before um that physics never has to do with a single frame really it has to do with pairs of frames so if you say well one pair one frame is absolute one frame is relative but it's saying well you're talking about pairs of frames and so whether you're talking about special relativity you know comparing two frames or whether you're talking about like Sheffer orthogonal Sheffer polynomials and how they relate to frames but this is more evidence to say that physics is all about the relationship of two frames in my in my little physics mind so all of these are themes and then the point is is that when we look at those two papers um more is talking about you know this uh seven plus well these basically these 10 different uh Oh, I messed this up. These two should go together. And then these eight, let's say. So this is eight plus two. This only has eight, but he repeats one. So it's eight plus one. Um, so, but they're all, they're both using this T squared and the C squared. Um, maybe just to make a point clear here that uh, when we were here, the T has a lift over here. Sometimes we write T tilde. Sometimes we write like T bar and T tilde. Everything here, this is like either Z2 or Z2 cross Z2. Everything here squares to one, right? There's no notion of minus one here. But over here, when you lift it to the group, then you have this notion of plus one or minus one. And that was what we had right here. Like it's either squaring to one or it's squaring to minus one, uh, where the one and minus one are basically in terms of the circle. One is zero degrees, minus one is 180 degrees. Does that make sense? So that's where this plus one and minus one are coming from. That's when they're they're in that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's this plus one and minus one. They're running through all those options. And um, he, they both run through all the options, but they're looking at it from, he's looking at it, how they relate to Clifford algebras. And this is basically what he's done. He's looked at the um, representations the the phi cross chi representations i guess i don't have the definition here i'll have to i'll have to show that maybe it's kind of nasty but then he relates that to graded clifford algebra representations and so he has this kind of map and so that's how he relates to the clifford algebras and these are the ones in red but these are the clifford algebras in black that we were dealing with and this is and see I had to draw them off kilter. Like if you look at this line, one comma T bar equals negative one, that would be this here. Um, TRS is negative one. Does that make sense? So those match up and then they're going in different or orders, you know, so like this is going down negative one, negative one, negative one. This is going here. You see, these are climbing up one plus one plus two plus three plus four. So they're going in opposite directions and then they're centered differently, but they have the, they have what they are. This is, um, again, the, the CT groups, he's looking at the graded reps, I'm sorry, the graded irrepresent, reps, they're built up here and they look very nice actually. They're like kind of like tensor products of this eta, eta squared, eta cubed, eta tilde, eta tilde squared. They kind of look nice in this form when you look at the graded irreps of the um what is Clifford irrep algorithms. i'm sorry i'm, I'm losing uh, it's a uh, irrep means irreducible representation okay so you see they can be graded they can be ungraded uh, you can have a graded algebra you can have an ungraded algebra and you can look at the so you can look at a clifford algebra as an ungraded algebra or you can look at it as a graded algebra when it's graded then like a single generator would be odd no generator would be even, but let's say a, uh, a square of generators or like power two would be even, power three would be odd. You know, it goes like that. That's a graded algebra. Uh, un so you can have a rep you can have a irreducible representation that doesn't care about the grading, or you could have one that does. And so there's not a lot of possibilities, but these are they are, and I have to learn about how they work and try to figure out like what I can gauge from that. Here's just some notation for this next slide, just to say I'm going to have an iota here, a, a phi here, a psi here, an iota here. So iota just means um, this here. Oh, 
On the last slide, I had this eta. That's a representation on this graded uh, algebra of R with one even, one odd. So either the generator gets mapped to I or the generator gets mapped to the swapping, okay, depending. And then you can tensor these. So if you tensor this times this, you would get a four by four matrix where it would be odd two by two blocks, and then each block would look like this, but you'd have to multiply the top block by negative one, and you could tensor it again and stuff. So that's that's how you're building these up. Here, the iota is uh, the two by two form for I, which is what the linear complex structure is built out of. But the second one would be this one here. Okay, that would be like when we built up the quaternions, the, the, like when we looked at the symplectic, uh, we use this. And here's this phi. Uh, that's this, uh, what this phi is, it's a, it's a um, uh, what is this? It's a switch. It's like time reversal. It's a, like conjugation. It's like conjugation. Also here, Lie algebra decomposition. We have been looking at these, uh, you and I have been looking at these uh, Lie groups, G mod H, and let's say M is an element. Well, then this M here, I'm sorry, M, yeah, maybe M is there. So this G, the Lie algebra G accords to this group, the Lie algebra H accords to this H, and then M is this other one that's left over, and M is an element in there. So if I look over here, I've got the Lie group embeddings that I've talked to you about before. I've got, um, I've got um, this uh, T, and C plus one minus one. And now I've got to the Clifford algebras that were in red and the Clifford algebras that were in black, and I'm trying to compare them. <clears throat> so the Clifford algebras are in red. I've got uh, C, IC, and ICT, as I mentioned. The Clifford algebras, uh, those are the generators, I'm sorry. Yeah, those are the generators. Now here, remember when you and I were working, okay, J1 is going to be this iota, that's the I, and it's on the diagonal, right? That's a, what a linear complex structure looks like if you have a nice basis for it. But then if you want another one, then you would have to have it look like this psi, these four by fours, right? Those would be the blocks. Are you with me on that, John? Uh, kind of, yeah. Yeah, okay. So that would be... And then the question was, well, how do you build up all these other ones? Well, it turns out, you can build them up in this way. We had talked like, you know, if you have a third operator, well, J1, J2, J3 would equal to, uh, that would, because it's three operators, it would square to plus one. Because it squares to plus one, an operator like that will carve up the space. Uh, it's like that operator squared minus the identity equals zero. So the eigenvalues will factor, they'll be plus or minus one. So it'll fix some things and it'll flip other things, just like the time reversal operator. So you'll get like an I1, a time reversal operator. Well, you can write it in this way. J3 inverse equals the time reversal operator times J1 times J2. Now, this one will be a 8 by 8 matrix where the 4 by 4 keeps it fixed. And then the other 4 by 4 swaps things, you know, flips them to negative. So that way you can build up J3 inverse. And then you can build up J4 inverse and J5 inverse and J6 inverse and J7 inverse. You can actually build them all up very concretely. The I's will all be like these time reversal where you 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 keep one dimension um, fixed and you flip the other dimension. And L would be an isometry. So basically that'd be like a swap, like the charge conjugation that would swap, it'd be odd and it would swap the one thing with the other thing. I think that's what must be. So you have a swap here, and then four steps later, you have a swap there, and you can build all these up. So that's pretty much where I have, like, and then J1 times the M, that's what your Hamiltonians look like. And when you get all the way down here, you have these two dimensions here where you want to, and I don't understand this yet, but you build up this phi, the phi looks like this, okay? So it's another swapping type of, I mean, it's another flipping thing, like this conjugation thing. So phi looks like the conjugation. I looks like this. And so you replace the J1, you have to replace it with a two by two matrix. You have to replace this with a conjugation, but then you get to keep going, okay? And you keep going. So 
there's somehow like you have to go beyond maybe what it is is that see when you have these flips these conjugations you're allowed to ignore the minus sign you just keep going with the positive stuff but at a certain point when you get down to here you can't do that anymore you have to double it and when you double it you have to start working you have to shift over to these two by two matrices and then you have to kind of redefine everything but you just go up by two by two matrices i'm starting to understand here i think a little bit yeah yeah it's, it's, not it, it's sort of yeah getting getting kind of obscure but mm -hmm. And so that's oh. that's where we are. And so this idea, I think, like with this fact that this six okay. matches this zero, just to conclude, six zero, and then there's another two that kind of make you go beyond. I'm starting to think like there's these six needs. I have lots of these structures where it's an eightfold structure, but there's like three plus three for the unconscious and conscious. And you add either a one in between or you add another one. You add these two and that kind of like it kind of lets you get beyond to that. And so that's where that's the whole talk. What so, do you so, the, so back up a couple of slides. Back up. Okay. So I didn't. I, I didn't. Only, you know, understood. You know, a, a thin outline of of what you were saying here, but you're saying that this is kind of the whole bag here in terms of how things are built up, right here. This is. It's getting there. Yeah. This, yeah. this kind of explains. Um, at least bot period is even from the point of view of CPT. Um, is there anything more to bot periodicity than this, or is this it? Is this like well, what, what, what I'm looking for? Is, I hope there's something more. And I mean, this is getting this is getting there, but um, you know, I'm looking for where these structures, yeah, are like where are these structures lurking, right? Like. You can kind of see a three cycle. You can kind of see like this double switch, but where do all these come in? It's just not clear yet. You know, I haven't found it. But if I go back to this, you see, so they need to be here in this J1, J2, J3, all the way up to J8, right? They need to be there. Uh, the question is, well, where are they? What do they mean? You know, what? They, but see, the CT, I. The, the C and the IC and the ICT, that's giving insight in terms of like metaphysically what's going on. So one thing I already like learned, like this I2, when you have this I2 or I3, that's really just a flip switch like this. This is like a, a conjugation. And what they say is like, just focus on the part that's fixed and ignore this part. Okay. So I think what that means in a certain sense is that in terms of size wise, it's not getting bigger, you know, when you multiply by this. When you do the L, I think maybe it has to double in size. So this is a two by twos. These are four by fours. These are maybe just four by fours. This might be eight by eights, eight by eights, eight by eights, eight by eights. And then when you get to 16 by 16s, then you need to rewrite what your J1 is because now you have to make your J1 into a two by two matrix, basically. You have to replace with a two by two matrix. Something like that, but that's um. Hmm. There's a lot to absorb here. I mean, it, it. I didn't even get to the papers. I mean, but um. Oh. Well, there's a lot. We'll know, save that for another time. It's kind of a big picture, but I I think it's it's coming in, it's coming slightly more in focus. You know, I mean, at least the Thanks. the major signposts. You know, in the uh, I don't. You know, again, to me, the details really matter in terms of understanding. So um, until I work out those details, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the spectral theory and all that stuff, it it's obscure to me. Um, so well, I think you've been doing a great job in terms of like relating the um, orthogonal, unitary, you know, the, the, the real complex quaternions. So now I'm starting to see, OK, like that's actually very important uh, because um, See, it all becomes about like, how do you have like a real structure on a complex space? 
or a complex structure on a real space or quaternionic. Or, it's running through all those possibilities, basically. And so everything you're doing is makes sense. And so, but at least now I'm getting a bigger context, like how to try to look at what you're doing. And I'll be able to maybe focus on making some videos, uh, you know, working on the videos we've been recording with you and uh, really getting into that. So that'll be good. And it, it's, and you can see like, there's a connection with the Hamiltonians. Like we can start to think about too. Okay, well, I've got a I've got a physics question, a, a, a bread and butter physics question for Thomas. Mm -hmm. So, um, I've been you know I've been trying to understand Lie groups and everything. So I'm I'm going back over rotational dynamics and uh, trying to derive it in a way that's more pleasing to me. And um, so there's this inertia tensor that every object has, and you have three principal axes. And my understanding is that if you're rotating along a principal axis uh, in free, it, it, free of uh, free of all external forces. So you just suppose you're in orbit or whatever, and, or in free space, or in a equivalent for reference frame, in a, a reference frame that's equivalent to free space, um, and you, you know, object starts tumbling. If it's tumbling along a principal axis, it will remain along that axis, right? It will tumble. Uh, if it's one of the axes of the principal axes, like or axes of symmetry, it will continue to rotate along that axis at a constant angular velocity because it's not being acted on by any torques or external forces, mm -hmm. right? But if it's not rotating along one of those axes, then it's gonna then tumble in a more exotic way, right? It's gonna yes. But that 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 motion does not need to be periodic, right? It's not necessarily depending, depending on the ratio of the of the eigenfrequencies of your specific axis. It may or if may not are, be periodic. If they are real and not rational, it doesn't need to be periodic. Okay, okay. And can it be chaotic? In other I words, guess that's in general it afterwards, but chaotic doesn't mean that it does leave its phase space. I mean, it's in the phase space, but can go around in the phase space in what one would call chaotic motion. Yes, okay. that's what I would guess. I mean, I'm not a specialist there. But... Yeah, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, okay. So, um, okay. Uh, so I'm just, I'm, it's just a reality check. You know, I'm just. Um, I so... mean, at least that's what I think. Yeah, that happens. Um, but if you are, if you, if your initial, um, so you're going to torque this thing initially and then leave it alone. If your initial torque is close to an axis of symmetry, if your initial torque is yes. almost parallel to an axis of symmetry, it will, it will kind of um, act as though it's moving. It, it, it's rotating along that axis for a while. In other words, it's fairly yes. stable if you're close to an axis of symmetry. Yeah, I, but I, the I, stability I depends on the being away from the stability axis how much. So chaoticity can set in if you wait long enough. Yes, okay. All right. Okay, so that, that was my question. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, thanks. I'm just grateful that uh, we could be together. Okay. I'm grateful um, for your friendship. I'm grateful I could do this talk to you. I mean, it really means so much. I work so hard on this because I just thought I want to tell you. And I, yeah. I, 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 I felt it was so hard. I didn't even show you how difficult that definition of the Phi Chi representations. I just don't understand the, the weeds yeah. of the complex vector space and then the real and the morphs whatever. That's for another video. But... Um, I did, um, I was making slow progress and then I, I got, I go just under this, just look at the big picture. And I, so I drew that big picture and then I saw these things don't line up at all. <laughs> it just seemed like hopeless. But then I go, no, don't think it's hopeless. Like, uh, it's actually informative. Maybe like it's uh, rich. And then I think I noticed the T and the C, they do have that nice picture and they do say like 
one of the Clifford algebra things like C based and one is T based, that became incursive. And then this maybe means more than people, the idea that six plus one plus one, I mean like three plus three, one plus one, that's a pattern that's very important in wondrous wisdom. And mm -hmm. this idea that you run through these closed possibilities of like the minds, but then you can step out, you see, and then it collapses. That's very beautiful. Like, so instead of having just a sudden contradiction, no, it's like you have a two-step process where you can kind of like climb out of where you were and just start over, you know, continue like for the consciousness. So uh, that's mm -hmm. anyway. So, but what I wanted to just say then was to pray uh, thanks um, for the beautiful people you are, but, but beauty that connects us, you know, that you're both beautiful souls. I want to be beautiful soul. I think I am a beautiful soul. And you're beautiful souls out there. And we're all praying together. Amen. Yeah. yeah, thank you. All right. So uh, I'll send you the recording of this. And Thomas, it was great seeing you. And and you, you said you said that next week next month you're getting together again. We get together once a month or okay. as and and uh, so yeah, we'll try to get together with you if you're free. All right. Maybe. Okay. 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 All right. Take care. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Bye. Bye. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. What do you get from the conversations we have together? Oh, so, you know, you've been always, always very encouraging of me uh, exploring many novel ideas, you know, so, you know, I've already, I get that from you, you know, you're sort of my, in a way over the years, been my, bit of my conscience, uh, you know, like, uh, that compels me to, compels me to keep working. Um, and then the other aspect, I mean, I, I think there's other aspects, so like, you're also very open to, you know, kind of novel ideas, so, you know, even if it's kind of some harebrained thing, like I, I think of time editing or his, history editing or something, which is really non, non-physical, uh, at, at least at this point, you know, you're, you're at least open to that conversation.